Hello, and welcome to the Abbott Hematology Hit Series today on the art and science of hematology morphology, platelet morphology. I am Lexi Krause of Labert, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. Today, our presenter, Dan Pelling, will share his decades-long expertise in morphology. He will start with the art and science of cellular straining principles and its importance in the hematology laboratory. Then he will tie this together for a review of unique patient cases that will help listeners align automatic hematology results, morpho uh, morphological findings, and clinical diagnosis. Dan is the site manager for blood sciences at St. Mary's Hospital Paddington, which is part of Northwest London pathology based in the UK. He has extensive training in the laboratory and has multiple degrees and holds the higher specialist diploma in hematology and is qualified in forensic medicine. In his spare time, he leads educational efforts in the hematology community. He teaches at both undergraduate and postgraduate level, is the lead tutor for the English program, stream of the multilingual international education program at He Hema Image, <clears throat> and holds advisory positions at UKNIQAS. Institute of Biomedical Sciences, and the European Hematology Association. Here are today's learning objectives. Observe a smear from normal blood, show platelet size and structure in the natural variation seen in healthy individuals, review smears that show abnormal platelet morphology, talk through platelet case studies, including platelet clumping and satellitism, both in vitro effects, and, under, excuse me, and underestimated platelet counts due to large or giant platelets not being recognized. Discuss disease states affecting the size, number, and functionality of platelets, such as may heglin anomaly and bernard soulier syndrome. Here are the required disclosures and disclaimers for today's presentation. And it is now my pleasure to welcome Dan. Dan, you may now begin your presentation. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. And I, again, I would like to thank Blood Academy for the use of their fantastic resource in being able to deliver this webinar. This is the third webinar. We will be looking at platelets today. We won't be going into a great detail about some of the clinical aspects of platelet pathologies. We will be looking more at the morphology that presents with platelets and also some of the uh, pitfalls and tips to overcoming some of the pitfalls that we see in the laboratory with some of our automated analyzers. Now, of course, whenever we're looking at any blood film, I will state, as I've stated many times before, we have to start from a viewpoint of what is normal in order to be able to identify what is abnormal. And what I hope all of our participants who have joined us today can see now is a low power view of a blood film. We can see the red cells, we can see the white cells, but dotted around in between some of these red cells, if we look closely, we can see some small purple spots. Let's zoom in. And as we zoom in on this blood film, we can see that these are in fact purple colored platelets. Now platelets are one of the, we call them cellular components of blood. And platelets usually are about one to three micrometers in diameter. 
In fact, if we look at some of the size of these compared with the red cells on this blood film from a normal healthy person, we can see they're about a third, maybe a quarter to a third of the diameter of most of the red cells. Even in a normal healthy person, there will always be a small variation in platelet size. And in fact, about 5%, maybe 6% of platelets can be 4 micrometers or even 5 micrometers in diameter. But that's, that's probably the limit. Any more than that, then we might be looking at a platelet pathology and we have to be very wary of that and therefore approach our blood film in the standard manner to make sure that we include all the considerations for platelet numbers and platelet appearance. Platelets have got another name. They're called thrombocytes. And in fact, that's where we get some of the terminology for our disorders from, thrombocytopenia, thrombocytosis. But if we want to be really strict about our terminology, then we really shouldn't be using those words thrombocyte, thrombocytopenia, thrombocytosis, because the word site derives from the Greek word for cell. And these aren't cells, platelet aren't cells. They're fragments from the cytoplasm of much larger cells, the megakaryocytes, which we really don't see circulating in the blood at all. However, thrombocytosis, thrombocytopenia, thrombocytes as an alternative name for platelets is so well ingrained in haematology parlance that there's no point in trying to be pedantic. It's just a, it's just an interesting point of curiosity. So we can see our platelets dotted around on this normal healthy film and they look to be quite a few. In fact, the normal reference range for the platelet count is approximately 140, 150 to 400 times 10 to the 9 per litre. Uh, of course, different countries may have different ways of reporting different units, um, but, but that is pretty much a very standard way of reporting the number of platelets. And of course, that covers 95% of the population as well. There will be a small number of people who have a slightly reduced platelet count, but they're perfectly healthy. And some patients that have a slightly higher platelet count, slightly above 400, they too are absolutely perfectly healthy. But let's think more about the structure of the platelet. Why, why does it appear as it does? If we zoom in, and we lose a little bit of resolution here, as one almost always does when we zoom in on these pictures, we can see that the platelet has a central purple area, maybe looks a little bit granular, and maybe a slightly pale sort of halo uh, ring around it, a blue looking appearance. These define the different regions of the platelet. So the inner area, the area that looks purple, stained purple, purpley blue, purpley red, using a standard Romanovsky stain, is known as the granulomere or the chromomere. And that's because it stains a colour and it's because of the granules in that part of the platelet. And the area around the platelet that looks slightly more pale, slightly more blue, is known as the hyalomere. So we just spend a few minutes looking around this normal film, we can see how the platelets appear. With that small variation in size um, of analyzers, that would be maybe a slightly higher PDW, platelet distribution width. But really nothing stands out as particularly small or particularly large or particularly discolored. And I use those three particular focal topics because that is what we're going to be looking at. Small platelets, large platelets and discoloured platelets. Now, with our technology today, we can get very accurate platelet counts across the spectrum of platelet numbers. But we do have to be aware 
that sometimes because of abnormalities in platelet appearance, the analyzers might produce falsely reduced platelet counts. And I'm going to be talking quite a lot about that as we move to our next slides. However, as a rough rule of thumb, if we are looking at a blood film under 100 times oil immersion, and we are looking in the correct part of the blood film, which is where the red cells are slightly touching, slightly overlapping, no big gaps between them, where we see the monolayer, then as a rough rule of thumb, we should see approximately seven to about 20, 25 platelets per field on average. Let's move to our next slide. I'll zoom right out on this slide. Macroscopically, we can see there are some big bits and clumps and it doesn't look very smooth at all. If we zoom in on this slide, we can see that in fact, there are these large clumps dotted around. Uh, the vast majority of medical laboratory workers and physicians will be familiar with the presence of platelet clumps. And we can see that some of these large clumps, well, in fact, they're so large, they can be seen by eye. Some of them are slightly smaller. In fact, some of them only comprise four or five platelets together. As we move around the slide, we can see this variation in platelet clumping. This is something that we have to be very aware of. If we run a complete blood count or a full blood count, and we notice an unexpected or unexplained low platelet count, then it is important to urgently review a blood film if, as I say, it's unexpected or unexplained and doesn't fit with any of the patient details or previous um, counts that may have been performed on a patient. It is important to check the full blood count, the actual sample for the presence of clots or microclots. If those aren't detected, looking at the film can often show the presence of these microscopic, even though they're quite large here, microscopic platelet clumps. And what has happened, the analyzer has produced this falsely reduced platelet count. But when we look at the blood film, we can see that, in fact, if all these platelets were, in fact, disaggregated, then the platelet count would probably be normal. It is very important to make sure that a falsely reduced platelet count, because of the presence of platelet clumps, is removed from the results that are reported and that a comment is put in in its place. Platelet count may be reduced due to the presence of platelet clumps. However, platelet numbers appear adequate. They might even appear increased. Sometimes we can get platelet clumps present and the platelet count would still be slightly reduced. However, by providing that statement, platelet count of, let's say, 16 is reduced due to the presence of platelet clumps. We're giving the physicians the absolute minimum platelet count that could possibly occur in this patient under these situations in this instance, but also telling them that in fact, the platelet count is probably normal because of these platelet clumps. When we notice platelet clumps, it is also very important to take a look at the white count to make sure that the white count hasn't been affected um, and falsely increased by the presence of these platelet clumps. When we look at the scatter plots on our analyzers, platelet clumps can usually be quite easily identified by a very specific discrete population. However, if there are numerous platelet clumps and a lot of them are quite large, that population can overspill into the regions of your scatter plots where gates are set for white cell differentials. So it is important to make sure that you look at the white cells to make sure that they haven't been falsely increased. 
one thing to notice, and it's quite curious about these films when we see platelet clumps, is that often it just looks like a bit of a homogeneous mess, almost like the platelets are stuck together. When we see this clumping, we often see that a lot of the platelets are degranulated. Part of this process of clumping together has caused the platelets to release their granules and they appear more grey or more blue. Um, so a lot of the platelets can appear quite pale. Here's an example. It's part of a platelet here that has lost most of its granular appearance. So it is important to look very carefully. But what actually causes platelet clumping? Are we, have we got patients who have platelet clumps circulating around, who are walking out there in the public? No. Platelet clumping is an in vitro phenomenon. And more often than not, it's mediated by the presence of EDTA, which is the common anticoagulant we uh, nearly all of us use for our full blood counts. The anticoagulant actually causes a conformational change in the glycoprotein receptors on the surface of the platelet. Specifically, it's the glycoprotein 2B3A receptor. And that actually causes the platelets to become slightly activated and to start clumping together. There are many methods that laboratories use to try and remove this aggregation, such as warming the sample or maybe gently vortexing, mixing the sample for a minute or so to mechanically disrupt the platelet clumps. Sometimes the addition of small amounts of antibiotics, such as amicacin, can cause the platelets to disaggregate. Sometimes the use of special tubes that have magnesium sulfate in them as their anticoagulant rather than EDTA can be used. But more often than not, the laboratories will ask for a citrated sample to come up, the type of sample that you'd use for a clotting screen. That can work, but I would say in my experience, 31 years in haematology, it, it really doesn't work very often and you still see platelet clumps in citrated samples. But if you do use a citrated sample to try and determine an accurate platelet count, one important thing to remember is that you must multiply the platelet count by 1.1 to take into account the dilution effect of the citrate that's present. Platelets can also be large. Platelets can also be small. If platelets are particularly large, even just individually, then they may not actually be included in the platelet counts on your analyzer. They may be so large that they fall outside the threshold for including the, the entity within the platelet count. And that's really what we're going to look at uh, for the rest of this presentation what's called the macrothrombocytopenias and the pitfalls. If we look at this slide at slightly lower power, we can see our platelets immediately dotted around in between the red cells. It's a slightly thick part of the film here but they're much more visible. That's the first thing that strikes us. They seem to be larger. And in fact, if we zoom in, we can see that some of these platelets are almost the same size as a red cell. As we move around the slide, the other thing that strikes us is that, in fact, there seem to be far fewer platelets as well. OK, we have two very large platelets here. In fact, I wouldn't even call them large. I would call them giant platelets. And there we have a distinction. 
So I said to start with that the majority of platelets are one to three microns in diameter. Some will be a little bit bigger. But when platelets begin to get to the size of five microns and six microns and so forth, they're termed large platelets. When a platelet becomes the size of a normal red cell, so about seven microns and above, they're termed giant platelets. And here we see some normal size platelets, some large platelets and some giant platelets together on this film. When we see this, it is very important for the microscopist to assess the number of platelets, because even though the platelets are large, and on this example we're looking at here, the platelet count is slightly reduced, you can have large platelets and they're completely normal platelet counts. Large platelets, they're all large, but the platelet count might genuinely be about 250. But because the analyzer hasn't included them in the platelet count, the analyzer might only have counted those platelets falling within the normal size range. So it may have produced a platelet count maybe of 60 or even 70 or even lower. It is crucially important to recognize that, to remove that incorrect automated platelet count and perform a manual platelet estimate from the film. Performing a manual platelet estimate from the film is something that takes a lot of practice. There are some rough rules of thumb that can be followed out there. My personal favourite way of producing a, a manual platelet estimate from the film is to find the part of the film that is the correct part to review. Again, the monolayer where the red cells are just touching or maybe slightly overlapping, where we can see a good amount of central pallor in the red cells. And then under 100 times oil, and it must be 100 times oil lens, count the number of platelets in 10 consecutive fields. I then determine what the average per field is from that and multiply that value by approximately 20,000. And that will give me my rough estimate. When you look in textbooks, some textbook might say follow that procedure, but use 15,000 at the end. Well, in fact, it's up to your local procedure what you determine to be the most accurate method. But remember, you're only looking at a very small number of fields, really. If I'm performing a manual estimate, I might follow that procedure once and get a result and then perform it again, get a result and take the average from that. The key thing is to notice in the first place that that platelet count is inaccurate. Of course, on the other side of the spectrum, we can have increased platelet counts uh, from the cytosis. And what we see here is a blood film from a patient with iron deficiency. Thrombocytosis can occur because of uh, a genetic defect, a congenital defect. Um, however, we see it most frequently as a reaction, a reactive thrombocytosis. To see a reactive thrombocytosis is quite common in pulmonary conditions. Um, not that uh, unusual in iron deficiency as well, although severe iron deficiency can actually um, result in the thrombocytopenia. But looking at this film here under a similar magnification as some of our other films, then we notice straight away where we can see far more platelets dotted around. The platelet count in this particular instance was a uh, about 500, 550, so about 25% increased above the top of the normal range. 
We can see, uh, again, a slight variation in size, but the vast majority of these platelets actually look normal in size and look all fairly similar in size as well. And that's what we tend to see when the, uh, the marrow um, is responding appropriately. If the marrow is responding appropriately to a condition where the platelets are actually being consumed or destroyed in the peripheral circulation, then what we might see is actually an increase in the variation of size of platelets. So let's have a little bit of a recap. We know what the normal platelet should look like. We know what uh, its morphology should be. We know that it has a slightly granular uh, a central part to it. Those granules are the alpha granules and the, the dense bodies. Within that granular mere or chromomere, the, it's the alpha granules that stain up, giving it this appearance. And there are many, many more alpha granules within that region than there are dense bodies. The alpha granules that stain up stain the way they do because they contain a lot of proteins, different types of proteins that are secreted and released as part of the platelet adhesion, activation and aggregation processes. There are far fewer dense bodies within that central region. The dense bodies generally contain, they contain quite a lot of uh, uh, components. However, they are responsible for storing ADP, ATP, calcium and magnesium. And of course, all important parts of the hemostatic process. But even in conditions of abnormal size, we can see fairly normal morphology. And even if you do have abnormally sized platelets, that doesn't always mean that they are dysfunctional. So you may have completely normal hemostatic processes. However, as the microscopist looking at the blood film and thinking, oh, these platelets are large, that should automatically trigger you to think about what could this be? Do I need to look for any other signs to help me narrow down what's going on here? Well, yes, and this is one perfect example. So there are a group of disorders, the macro thrombocytopenias, so we see macro, large platelets and reduced platelets, um, and then just these sort of normal number macrocytic platelet conditions. One set of conditions is the MYH9 conditions. Now, in times gone by, we would have called these Mayheglin anomaly, Sebastian syndrome, Fechner syndrome, Epstein syndrome, and possibly even Eckstein syndrome as well. And they were all thought to be completely separate disorders. But as technology has allowed us to investigate these more thoroughly, we now know that they are part of a spectrum of one complete disorder known as the MYH9 disorders. It's a mutation in the myosin heavy chain 9 that results in macro thrombocytes, large platelets and giant platelets. And in this particular disorder, Mayheglin anomaly, the presence of white cell inclusions. Whenever my staff come and ask me to look at an unexpected low platelet count, and I, I notice large platelets or large platelets, but in fact, it's just a normal platelet count. One of the first things I do, look at the neutrophils to see if I can identify any pale grey, pale blue inclusions, usually towards the periphery of the neutrophil. Because if I can, and they can be very subtle, you have to look carefully, 
If I can, then I think I know what I'm looking at. This is most likely a Mayheglin anomaly. And I check the automated count against the count that I think uh, should be coming from the blood film. See these pale blue bodies. Double check that the platelet count is going out correctly and then have a discussion with the physicians. May Heglin anomaly isn't the only anomaly that we see with these large platelets, as I mentioned. If I scroll out to a lower magnification on this film, then we again can see immediately that we have a, a fairly decent number of platelets, probably slightly on the low side, but they are nearly all of them are large again. Here we have one that's a giant platelet, virtually the same size as the red cells. And here it's really emphasized the different zones within the platelet. This is a condition called Bernard Soulier syndrome, which results from mutation in one of the, uh, uh, which results in a, a a mutation in one of the glycoproteins on the surface of the platelet, the glycoprotein 1B, or the 1B95 complex. And as I said right at the beginning, we're not going to look at these specific disorders in depth. What we're really doing is emphasizing here the need to be aware that a lot of these platelets may well not have been included in the automated platelet counts. And the analyzer could easily have produced a platelet count of probably about uh, 15, 20, maybe 25 on this patient. And looking at it, looking at this film now, we know that in fact it's far higher than that. In the previous webinar with Abbott and Labroots, we did look at red cells. And one of the things we spoke about is when you're looking at a blood film, it's very important to identify the presence of red cell fragments. Well, linking that in with today's webinar, when you have this unexpected or unexplained low platelet count and you are urgently looking at a blood film, it is so important to remember to look for some key features. And that's the presence of clumps, which we've looked at, the presence of platelet satellitism, when platelets are bound to the outside of neutrophils. It's also very important for the presence of blasts, because you may be looking at a, a new hematological neoplasm. Also to look for the presence of malarial parasites within the red cells is not uncommonly Malaria can actually be picked up for the first time because you're looking at a blood film due to the presence of unexpected or unexplained low platelets. But it is ultra important to look for the presence of red cell fragments because the combination of red cell fragments and low platelets can indicate some very, very emergent diseases. These are usually the thrombotic microangiopathies, microangiopathic hemolytic anemias. And what we see here is a thrombotic microangiopathy. And even at this power, we can see the red cells don't look normal. A lot of them look like they've been 
broken up and smashed or cheese wired or stripped or cut in half and they look very angular and pointy. But remembering that we're approaching our blood film in the standard uh, manner and not forgetting our platelets, we also notice, in fact, there are very few platelets because we know what they look like now, whether they're large or normal, um, we know what they should look like. We, uh, we can't see any. Well, just maybe one or two dotted around, very low number. This combination actually heralds um, in this particular case, it was a post bone marrow transplant thrombotic microangiopathy, but it looks very, very similar to a condition called TTP, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. Incredibly urgent condition. Patients can actually succumb to this very, very quickly. We're talking a matter of hours sometimes. So that's not to scare anyone, but it is to be realistic and to emphasize the importance of checking out low platelets. So I would estimate the platelet count probably in this patient to be it would be less, less than 20, I would say. And what is quite interesting is that platelet count doesn't always correlate with bleeding phenotype. So, in fact, you can have a very high platelet count and have a bleeding disorder because the platelets might be dysfunctional. It is not particularly usual for patients to, to bleed if their platelet counts above 50. Between 50 and 20, they may have some sort of uh, bleeding presentation, but patients really only start to present with a bleeding anomaly if, if they've got normal platelets, but their platelet count is less than about 30, 20, 30. This patient had a lot of other things going on because we can see how jolly bodies, but really we're just focusing on platelets today. This slide, before I go back and recap some other points, um, is very important because, as I mentioned, if you're looking at a film because of unexpected, unexplained low platelets, the clinical team might not have considered a travel history and you might pick up malaria. Uh, malaria can be quite uh, can be quite tricky to identify. Um, however, depending upon the experience of the microscopist, then it's usually identifiable as a present from thick films and then species identification from thin films. But what can look quite similar to malaria is a condition called Babesia. The young stages, the trophozoites can look very similar, although the trophozoites are generally a lot smaller. But the reason this slide is included in today's webinar is because unlike in malaria, Babesia parasites are also extra erythrocytic. Malaria you will see inside the red cell, Babesia you will see inside the red cell, but also outside the red cell on the blood film between the red cells. And they can look like platelets. And um, Babesia parasites can sometimes clump together and look like platelet clumps. So it is very important to know the cause or the clinical details behind a patient presenting with unexplained low platelets. So there are a number of conditions as well where the granulation doesn't look correct in platelets. They can have vacuoles, they can have 
gaps. They can have large plate, large granules, big, big granules. And those have separate conditions themselves. So we have conditions such as uh, uh, Paris Trousseau or Jacobson syndrome, where we see large platelets, but with abnormal granulation, large platelets abnormal granulation, sometimes some big, just a few big red granules within within the plate itself. But we see abnormal platelets, depending upon your patient cohort, to this degree, large platelets, small platelets, disgranular platelets in the myeloproliferative neoplasms, the myelodysplastic syndromes, and the overlap syndromes, the myelodysplastic myeloproliferative neoplasm overlap syndromes. And so that course includes polycythemia vera, essential thrombocythemia, myelofibrosis, primary myelofibrosis, and chronic myeloid leukemia. Because of the overlap, it can also, this sort of thrombocyte appearance, platelet appearance, can also appear in atypical chronic myeloid leukemia and in the chronic myelomonocytic leukemias as well. It does emphasize the need to look at the whole bigger picture when you're approaching your slide. Remember, don't just focus on the platelets if they look abnormal, or don't just focus on the white cells if they look abnormal. Think about everything together. But this is an essential thrombocythemia patient. And again, if we go to roughly the same magnification as we've looked at in our other slides, we can see that there is a vastly increased number of platelets. This platelet count is probably up around the 900, 1000 mark. As we zoom in, we can see that they are abnormally granul granulated. and with quite a significant variation in size. The number of platelets that are that large or even giant is not sufficiently high to have falsely reduced the platelet count. The majority of platelets do look within that region where they would have been counted by the analyzer. But one of the things we do have to be aware of is that if some platelets are very agranular or very sort of hypogranular or even agranular, they may not have actually been included. And these are almost like platelet fragments, a hypogranular or agranular fragments of the cytoplasm from the megacarrier sites. One other tip, pitfall, or thing to be aware of in the laboratory is that what looks like a platelet might not always be a platelet. What I've put up here is a picture of a T-cell prolymphocytic leukemia because it really highlights this specific point I'm trying to get to now, which is sometimes you can have white cells with ragged cytoplasm or with a cytoplasmic blebs. These cells that I'm showing here are white cells. They're T cell prolymphocytes. And classically, they demonstrate these cytoplasmic blebs. In some white cell conditions that have these blebs, um, such as T cell prolymphocytic leukemia or even megakaryoblastic leukemia, these blebs can actually break off the red cells and start freely circulating. 
um, there are some other myeloid leukemias, not just the megacarrier blastic leukemias, where this can happen as well, especially if the blasts and the blast population is quite fragile. What we see then are these pale blue bits of cytoplasm circulating, which may be detected and counted by the analyzer as platelets. The genuine platelet count in this patient was very, very low. However, some of these pale blue hypogranular or agranular entities that are circulating are in fact cytoplasmic fragments. They're not platelets. So we have to be very aware of a falsely elevated platelet count coming off an automated platform when we know from the morphology that there are these blebs and cytoplasmic fragments present. Again, if this were the case, we would go to the correct part of the film and try to attempt a genuine platelet estimate from the film using whatever is your agreed local method. So I'm going to move between two separate films that we've looked at before now, just to emphasize. So almost as if we're looking at two films like that, normal and macrocytic. So moving backwards and forwards, just a few times there, you begin to see and get your eye in on the difference in platelet size, the increased MPV, mean platelet volume. And for most normal, healthy subjects, the MPV or the mean platelet volume will rest somewhere between about 7 and 10, maybe 7 and 12 femtolitres. When you begin to get above that 12.5s, the 13s, maybe even up to the 20 mark, that's when you're looking at the macro thrombocytes. And that's when you have to consider the automated platelet counts and the presence of other inclusions, such as, as we looked at in our May Heglin case, the presence of these pale blue gray inclusions in the neutrophils. Many people will refer to these as oh, doly bodies. They're not true doly bodies, they're doly-like bodies. They have a slightly different uh, uh, slightly different appearance in when you look at them and their ultrastructure. Um, but to recognize their presence and to comment on them is the most important thing. I mentioned earlier on that some of the platelets may be very hypogranular and uh, or even agranular. And that's when we have to consider whether they're blast fragments or blebs from the, the uh, cytoplasm of other white cells. But we do have a condition called gray platelet syndrome. And that's due to the lack of alpha granules that can be seen on a Romanovsky stained film. Those conditions can also result in the analyzer producing a falsely reduced platelet count because some analyzers that actually use uh, laser light and, and angle scatter to determine the size and granularity of an entity in order to classify it as a platelet won't have that granularity to measure in gray platelet syndrome. So it may not include what is a platelet in the final platelet count. 
because those platelets in grey platelet syndrome have uh, lost their alpha granules, yes, they are dysfunctional. They don't work properly. And the low platelet count um, can probably, the falsely reduced platelet count can be aligned with a clinical history or examination history in order to start working towards diagnosis. But what that does is mentioning grey platelet syndrome is bring everything sort of together um, about the large platelets and the discoloured platelets um, into one sort of picture to say these are the things that you need to consider. But what I will end up with is talking about the other end of the spectrum, the very small platelets. There are some conditions, they are rare, where the platelet number, it, it might be normal, it might be reduced, the platelet number um, can fall within any range really, um, but the platelets all look very small, less than one micrometer, sometimes 0.5, sometimes just almost like a little pinprick between the red cells. This can be associated with just a, a very a small a handful of conditions. But one of the ones that is uh, referred to the most in the textbooks is Wiscott Aldrich syndrome that combines autoimmune sort of uh, uh, processes, eczema, um, and it's due to a gene mutation, the WASP gene mutation, that's uh, characterized by micro. It's just looking for the falsely reduced platelet count of the analyzer because of large platelets. Be aware of the clinical history, a young child, eczema, autoimmune history, and a very small, numerous yet very small platelets on the blood film. Could you be looking at a Wiscott Aldrich syndrome child? Very closely related to Wiscott Aldrich syndrome because of the underlying molecular processes in the mutation is X-linked thrombocytopenia and X-linked neutropenia. They do also present with small platelets. So be aware of all the platelet ranges. Be aware of the platelet granularity. Um, be aware of other inclusions in white cells, not just doli-like bodies in neutrophils, but maybe other large inclusions in, in neutrophils and like monocytes and lymphocytes that could indicate shediac higashi syndrome, for example, which can be associated with thrombocytopenia and a variation in, in platelet size. And try and put everything together, bring it all together, that bigger picture. So when we approach our film, and we use our standard approach to make sure we don't miss out one of the lineages. We look at the red cells, we look at the white cells, we look at the platelets. Platelets are very often the least remarkable lineage to comment on. Usually we're looking at, at blood films because of red cell abnormalities or, or white cell abnormalities. When we're looking at platelets, it's usually because it's unexpectedly low um, or it's low and we can't explain it with clinical history. But occasionally you will get the very interesting case go through where they're large, they're disgranular, they're particularly small. And that's when you think, OK, I might have something interesting going on here. I need to investigate it in a little bit more depth in order to drive that diagnosis forward, whittle it down at least. It is a very large topic, and if you go to the textbooks or you go to some of the reputable websites, there will be tables with lists of various conditions um, uh, 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 that are, are associated with large platelets um, or small platelets or platelet abnormal platelet granularity, and it will talk about uh, Scott syndrome, Stormorkin syndrome, York syndrome, Harris syndrome. Um, congenital A megakaryocytic thrombocytopenia, thrombocytopenia associated with radio ulnar synostosis. There's an awful lot to remember, and more mutations are being identified almost on a on a monthly basis that are associated with thrombocytopenia or with the presence of large platelets. <laughs> 
So it's it's not something that uh, you can look at and you can learn, but it's a very interesting topic to make sure that you stay abreast of um, for when that patient comes in who may have bruising, may have bleeding, or may just be having a regular checkup, and that could be how you pick it up. So this has been uh, quite uh, a brief tour of the topic. I hope you've enjoyed this as an introduction, and I'm sure that in the coming few months, we will be looking at other topics with Abbott and with LabRoots. Uh, I will end this session now. Uh, we do have time for questions and answers and be more than happy to take some questions and provide the answers where I can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan, and we appreciate your time today and all of the valuable information you have presented for our audience. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. But before we answer your questions from the audience, we would like to acknowledge the support of the Blood Academy Center for Hematology Education by providing the blood film images that this webinar is based on. Please visit the center at www.blood-academy.com if you are interested in learning more. So Dan, let's go ahead and move on to our questions. The first question that we have for you is, why do platelet numbers increase with iron deficiency? Well, uh, thank you. Yes, that is that is a very good question, and it is something that we frequently see um, in the laboratory, not least because iron deficiency is, is a very common condition um, across the globe. That there have been many studies into this, and, and it was thought that uh, it was uh, a reactive thrombocytosis that was driven by cytokines um, and sort of the bone marrow environment being triggered to create more megakarrier sites and to release more platelets. But studies have shown that it may be not that easy to determine why we do see increased numbers of platelets in iron deficiency. Now, megakaryocytes are the main cells from which platelets are derived, and about 1,000 to 3,000 platelets per normal megakaryocyte. But even in the presence of cytokines such as interleukin-6, which we see increased in inflammatory conditions, it doesn't seem to be a direct connect connection between that cytokine level and the number of platelets. Now, one could argue that one cause of iron deficiency is bleeding, occult bleeding, or maybe um, some other sort of, uh, sort of gastrointestinal bleeding. And through evolution, we have some as yet to be determined mechanism that increases our platelet count to try and stop that bleeding. So we can see why there might be a, an increased platelet count in iron deficiency, but really, no one's really figured out quite how that happens yet. Great. Thank you so much, Dan. One of the questions is actually a, re a recommendation from you. Do you recommend to draw blood samples with heparin or citrate for PLT clump cases? Okay, so this has been a thorny question for everybody working in hematology labs for many years. <laughs> um, um, now, historically, we have said in many areas, if you see platelet clumping in EDTA, request a citrated count and run that count and then correct it for the dilution factor by multiplying it by 1.1. Um, <clears throat> But I've been practicing hematology for 31 years, and I would say the vast majority of times a citrated platelet count has not resolved the issue of EDTA-induced platelet clumping. We often see platelet clumps just as frequently in those um, citrated samples. We have recently started looking at heparinized samples because with heparinized samples, you don't have to correct for the dilution factor. Um, and we do see a slight improvement. 
i.e. a reduction in the number and size of platelet clumps that we see. But really, if, if someone has got quite a strong autoantibody, they are going to experience platelet clumping with almost any type of anticoagulant. I would say, in the old days before EDTA was used, we used to use magnesium sulfate as an anticoagulant. And one does not see platelet clumping with magnesium sulfate as an anticoagulant. So that could be something that people might wish to explore. Also, slight addition of amicacin, the antibiotic to disaggregate platelets, or gentle vortexing. There are many methods out there, and one has to see what works best. At the moment, I would say when I ask, well, when I ask my laboratory staff to request a repeat, I ask them to request both a citrated sample and a heparinized sample. I tend to sit on the fence about that. Well, thank you so much, Dan, for, uh, for your recommendation. And looks like we've got time for one more question. So what is the relationship between Kawasaki disease and thrombocytosis? Kawasaki disease and thrombocytosis. Okay, um, that would be a question that I would have to look into in a little bit more depth. Um, really, uh, again, there could be a reactive component to it, um, quite a deep reactive component to, to Kawasaki disease that may be driving some sort of thrombocytosis. Um, but... Uh, I think that w that is a sort of question, really, that uh, it really takes time to think about um, and, and get back um, to to the person who's asked that question. What I would say is, for anyone who who may be listening and is is not familiar with Kawasaki disease, we can see extremely high platelet counts in Kawasaki disease. Um, so what is driving the platelet count, the thrombocytosis, to that extreme level. Um, there, there are papers out there. It's not particularly clear, again. Um, what really we wanted to, to focus on today was, was not necessarily the platelet count uh, correlation with disease states, because it can be manifold. This was more looking at some of those morphological features that we can see on platelets and how they can trip us up sometimes or even indicate what disease state we might be looking at. Um, as we know in haematology, in almost every case, the exceptions prove the rule. Um, so really looking at, looking at that, uh, the platelet count and, and those disease states such as Kawasaki where it is so high or can be so high, um, it, it really is, is probably another topic in its own right, another webinar in its own right. It is a very good question, though. Well, we would look forward to having you back for that one. So, <laughs> Dan, we're going <laughs> to keep you on for actually one more question. Here's a really good one that just came in from the audience. So are there any cases in which we will see megakaryocytes or megachiroblasts in the peripheral blood, and what would be the cause for that? Yes, there, there are some states where we can see uh, megakaryocytes in the peripheral blood, or megakaryoblasts, um, and also bare megakaryocyte nuclei. Now, we megakaryoblastic leukemias under the the previous FAB classification, classified as M7, one can see megakaryoblasts circulating. Bear in mind that they are likely to be in low numbers, but they are quite distinctive with quite a high nucleocytoplasmic ratio and frequently with cytoplasmic blebbing. Now, we do see some uh, very sort of infantile leukemias, certainly with translocations between chromosome 1 and 22, which often have a megakaryoblastic component to them as well. Um, so we can see them in, in those conditions where it's driven by a malignancy um, in its own right. Uh, 
But when the bone marrow is under stress, whether that's through extreme uh, uh, sort of infection or infiltration, maybe infiltration from some other uh, carcinoma sites, then we can see a lot of the bone marrow components spilling out and over into the peripheral blood, megakarya sites being one of those. Because megakarya sites have quite that sort of voluminous cytoplasm that can frequently be stripped um, from them in the process of moving from the marrow environment to the peripheral blood, which sometimes leaves us with circulating bare megakarya site nuclei which, are, again, are quite distinctive with their lumps and their folds and their clefts as, as the nuclei are folded on one another. So that, that marrow stress, the marrow stress, whether that's through infection or infiltration, or marrow stress can also be through direct malignancy, such as myelofibrosis. But we can see megakaryocyte fragments and the occasional bare megakaryocyte nucleus or small megakaryocyte intact circulating in essential thrombocythemia and also uh, myelofibrosis as well. So quite a few conditions. It's certainly abnormal and it is the signal for you to stop and think about what might be going on. Great. Thank you so much, Dan. We want to, you know, thank you again for your informative presentation. Do you have any final comments for our audience before we let you go? I, I do have a, a one final comment, uh, really, and that is, and this is a, a thread throughout all of the, the webinars, really, is that it's, it's important to step back and take in the entire picture, even when you're looking at platelets. Sometimes they're, off, they're overlooked because they're not very exciting. They're quite small, but they can tell you a lot about what is going on reactive-wise or malignancy-wise. But the, one of the biggest problems we see um, across the globe are misreported platelet counts. And that is because we can often be unaware that large platelets or grey platelets might not be counted by our analyzers, fantastic though they are these days. And it's our job to act as those gatekeepers when we're looking at the blood film to say, no, this time the analyzer's not right. And me, as the scientist, I'm going to correct it and, and give out a, a, a more accurate platelet estimate from the blood film. So it's looking at it from that laboratory position and being aware of what can go wrong as well that is so important. And I hope that is really one of the key things that, that our audience has taken away from today. Thank you again, Dan, for your time today and your important information. Uh, excuse me, and your important and informative presentation. We would also like to thank our sponsor, Abbott, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions, questions that we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by our speaker via the contact information that you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand Labyrinths will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, bye-bye, everyone.